songbook let's all sing together number 281 please 281 we have heard the joyful sound jesus saves jesus saves 281 once you have it let's stand together to sing shall we all of us standing 281 oh we have heard the joyful sound jesus saves Sits and cross the waves Onward tis our Lord's command And Jesus saves, Jesus saves Oh, often on the rolling tide Jesus saves, Jesus saves Well, he saves far and wide Jesus saves, Jesus saves Jesus saves, Jesus saves. On the last stanza now together. Give the winds a mighty voice. Good singing this morning, and uh, Brother Bob is out, as you can tell, uh, this morning, so uh, you got you got to have me leading music today, and uh, I enjoy it, and uh, but I'm not used to it, <laughs> and uh, running downstairs or running upstairs, and uh, but it's uh, it's great to see you here this morning. Pray for Brother Bob. I think he'll be back tonight, and uh, we, we look forward to that, uh, him being here. Good to see you here this morning in church, and uh, starting out the month of March, by being in church this morning. It's good to have you here. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, we bow before you in prayer. We thank you, Lord, for another Lord's Day that you've blessed us with. And Father, we're thankful for the good news that we just sang about, that we've heard the joyful sound, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. And Lord, our prayer this morning would be if any in this room have never experienced coming to know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, that they would come to know him today as their savior so i pray that he'll be lifted up he'll be exalted in all that's said and done and lord that you'll be pleased with our service that we have together here this morning may your will be done in our midst today and we ask it in jesus name amen, amen. all right be seated if you will keep your songbook handy turn over to number 268 if you would please 268 sing of my Redeemer. I will sing of my Redeemer.
story, how my lost estate to save, in his boundless love and mercy, be the ransom breathing day, and sing or sing of my Redeemer, he purchased me. forth now together. I will sing of my Redeemer. singing this morning. That's great. Now we have a few announcements for you. If you listen carefully, we'll have a regular schedule today. That means a 530 Christian growth class that meets uh, down in the conference room, which is right across from our nursery. And uh, our lesson this evening is how to get along with people. Probably don't need that class, but uh, maybe you do. And, uh, you know, uh, it's some good truths and some principles that will help you. And so uh, that's open to anyone who'd like to be there for the 530 class. That's 530 over in the conference room uh, this evening. Then 630 tonight, Lord willing, we'll be right back here in the auditorium uh, for the Sunday night service. And I'm going to talk to you tonight on how to know the will of God. How to know the will of God. You know, God is not in the business of trying to hide his will from us. Okay? Uh, but there are some things we can do to make it much easier to know the will of God. And I can tell you why sometimes you struggle with knowing what is it that God wants me to do. And you understand uh, God didn't write a book that gave us every single option or every single choice, whether you should live on Elm Street or Oak Street or, you know, uh, what kind of car you should buy and all those kind of things. If you had a book that told you all those decisions for everybody in the world, you understand we couldn't... Uh, uh, we'd have to go look at it somewhere and train loads at a time. Uh, but he did give us some principles that will help us. And so if you're uh, curious about how can I know God's will, be back tonight, 630, for the evening service. Now, remember, uh, next Sunday is Time Change Sunday. Okay, we're at this time next week. It will be 20 till 12. Okay, so if you show up at 1030 for church, we might just be coming out as you're coming in. All right, so uh, you want to make sure you pull it ahead Saturday night and uh, get to bed a little bit early. You're going to lose an hour. And uh, so let's be prepared for that next Sunday for Time Change Sunday. All right. I think that's uh, all I have to do. Are the ladies going to have a meeting tonight after service? Okay, those are low ladies going on the retreat, uh, which is this coming Friday and Saturday up in Mansfield, the ladies' retreat. Uh, you'll have a short meeting with Ms. Slaybaugh uh, in the conference room, Ms. Lindy, uh, right after the service tonight. I think you're going to get all your plans finalized and uh, what time you go and where you're meeting and all those good things. And uh, that'll be a great time for you ladies this weekend. Okay? Now, let's take a moment. We'll welcome any guests we have with us in the service. Always pleased when people visit with us in the services here at Bible Baptist Church, and if you brought a guest with you today, or you're just visiting on your own, we'd love to meet you, find out who you are and where you're from, just honor us by standing for a moment, if you would please, if you brought a guest with you, and we can meet him. Mike has somebody with him. Great, right? Good to have you this morning. Great. And from, okay, good, good. Ryan, thanks for coming this morning. That's great. And uh, thank you, Mike, for bringing him. That's good. Right here, Ricky? Michael, good. Good to have you this morning, Michael. Thank you for being in church today. God bless you. That's great. All right. Anyone else today? 
Have you been here? You got one right back here? Okay. Sure. What, what's your name? I didn't catch that. Dan and Monica. Good. Good to have both of you today. Thank you for being here. That's great. All right. Ushers are going to hand you a, a welcome card there. If you'd be kind enough just to fill that card out for us, we sure would appreciate it. And a little bit, we have the offering. And uh, then when you have that card filled out, if you'll put that in the offering for us and keep the pen as our gift to you for coming this morning. We're glad you're here. All right. Let's give our guests a warm welcome, shall we? Take your songbook again. We're going to sing together this morning. Number 294, 294, my faith has found a resting place, not in device nor creed. Number 294, you can remain seated while we sing. On the first stanza together, my faith has found a resting place, not in device nor creed. wounds for me shall plead. I need no other argument. I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. Let's sing the third stanza together, shall we? My heart is leaning on the word, the written word of God. No other argument, 
Jesus died and that he died for me. We're going to sing the fourth stanza, but let's all stand together and sing it. And we're going to let the children go out for children's church when we sing this fourth stanza. Uh, My great physician heals the sick. Stanza number four together. My great physician heals the sick. The lost he came to save. Life he gave. I need no other argument. I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. Turn over just a few pages to 275, would you please? When peace like a river attendeth my way. When sorrows like sea billows roll, it is well, it is well with my soul. 275. Satan should bob it. Good singing. Instruments are going to play that through a few times. Greet each other this morning, especially our guests. We'll come back and do the fourth stanza.
my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. On the third stanza now, let's sing that together. My sin, oh the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, oh the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole is nailed to the cross. the day and Lord haste the day when the faith shall be sight of the clouds be Everybody said? Amen. Amen. Great singing this morning. You can be seated. Thank you for helping me out. Ushers are coming and getting our offering this morning. This is our special, we call higher ground offering. Uh, it goes with our theme for the year. Uh, we are in need of uh, some new doors uh, in the fellowship hall and this building and also wanting to upgrade some of our lighting. Uh, in here uh, is getting to trying to save on some of our electric bills and such and uh, so we're going to put money towards that and um, I'm drawing a blank on the third oh carpet carpeting for this auditorium those are the goals we have for this year and uh, so that's what we're giving towards uh, this morning I appreciate you praying and preparing and uh, let's ask the Lord's blessing as we give the offering this morning brother Danny lead us in our prayer Let's pray. Father, we, we love you and we just thank you for another opportunity to gather here in this place with the men and women of God. And Father, we ask that you would go up and down every aisle and stop at every occupied seat. Speak to us today, Lord. We need to hear from you. Our prayer is that everyone in this place would build a personal, intimate, real, life-transforming relationship with you, Father, that we get the right people in our lives and the wrong people out. We love you, Lord, and we need you. Without you, we're nothing. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. amen.
Thank you, Lisa. I'm reminded the fellow who wrote that song, that's Jesus Loves Even Me. Uh, that's not what Adam's saying, but he could have. Um, you'll get that later. But uh, he wrote that. Uh, it's interesting. He wrote two, two songs similar. The first song he wrote was shortly after he got saved. And he wrote the song, Oh, How I Love Jesus. Oh, How I Love Jesus. Oh, How I Love Jesus. But that song he wrote, more towards the end of his life after he'd been saved for many many years and then that this time he didn't write about how much he loved Jesus he wrote about how much Jesus loved him and uh, that's the amazing thing is your is your walk with the Lord through your life uh, the thing that amazes you still is not that you love him but that he loves me and uh, that's great that was a good good offertory take your Bible this morning if you would Matthew 16 please Matthew 16 You'll want to slow that down for the special, fellas. It's okay for me. You turn it right back there when she's done, okay? But uh, for a singer, sometimes they don't like that air blowing on them, so make sure that's off. And the same thing with this fan over here, Michelle. When they begin up to sing, just hit that bottom button there, Shane, if you would, and then hit that one back on once they're done singing, okay? All right, thank you for doing that. Are you comfortable? Are you warm? Are you okay? Everybody's all right? Okay. All right, we're in Matthew chapter 16, and we're going to read verses 21 through 26. Verses 21 through 26. And we'll read the verses responsively as we normally do. Let's all stand together to read the scripture. All of us standing. We'll begin together on verse 21, then I'll read 22, and we'll alternate reading until we read through verse number 26. Let's begin on verse 21 of Matthew chapter 16. Ready? From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. And then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. And let's read 26 together also. For what is it man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? And let's pray together, shall we? Our Heavenly Father, we bow before you in prayer now this morning. We thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you, God, for not only inspiring your word, but preserving your word for us that we hold copies in our hand this morning. And Lord, we desire that you make our hearts ready, that we'll be prepared to receive your word, that each of us would listen carefully for the still, small voice of God. Lord, I pray that your will would be accomplished in every heart and life and that you'd use the truth from your word to help us to be better servants of thine. Now, Lord, prepare our hearts with the special this morning. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Oh, Lord, my God. When I in awesome wonder consider all the works thy hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power through the universe displayed then sings my soul my savior god to thee how great 
great thou art, how great thou art, then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee, how great thou scarce can take it in that on the cross my burden gladly bearing he bled and died to take away my sin then sings my soul my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art, then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou shall come with shout of acclamation and take me home what joy shall fill my heart then I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim my God, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul. Amen. Wonderful. I don't care who you are, that, that should have blessed your soul right there. Wonderful. How great thou art. Father, you are a great God, and we're thankful that we're your people. And Lord, we're gathered here today in your name, and we've sung our songs as unto thee. We are opening up your book. We're asking that you'll speak to every heart by your Spirit. And Lord, as we look today, particularly here at the words of Jesus in Matthew, that God, you would speak to us just as clear as the disciples heard Jesus speak that day. And I pray that each of us would listen carefully to the words that Jesus said and help us to understand. And I pray you would help us all to be followers of Jesus Christ. It's in his name we ask it. Amen. Jesus said, if you have your Bible open there to Matthew chapter 16. He said, if any man, in verse 24, will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and... What's the last two words of that verse? Say that again together. Follow me. What exactly does that mean? What exactly does it mean to be a follower of Jesus Christ? You know... Here in the passage, Jesus has begun to tell His disciples uh, that it's going to be the will of God that He suffer and die on the cross. 
and that he's going to be betrayed by the chief priests and the scribes and killed, and he'll rise again the third day. And of course, Peter, fresh off his confession that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, and Jesus telling him, you didn't come up with that on your own. Flesh and blood didn't reveal that to you. My Father revealed that to you. And Peter got a little big-headed about it. And so he felt like he could take Jesus and rebuke him. Thought he knew better than what Jesus knew. Don't be too hard on him. There's times you and I have thought the same thing. Say, how do you know that? When we say, well, I don't know why that happened. Or I don't know why this happened. Or I don't know why God put me in this situation. What we're saying is, if I was God, I wouldn't have done it that way. See, we, we kind of think we know a better plan than what God has. And that's the way Peter was. And now he goes from, Thou art the Christ, Son of the living God, and flesh and blood had not revealed to you, my Father which is in heaven, to get thee behind me, Satan. You savor us not. You don't care about the things of God. You care about the things of man. And so, then Jesus said unto his disciples, understand who he's talking to here. He is not talking to everybody. He's talking to His disciples. He chose 12 men that He would train and work with and teach and they would learn of Him. And He's going to teach them about being followers of Jesus Christ. Let me, let me make a distinction. There is a difference between being a believer in Jesus Christ and being a follower of Jesus Christ. But I will submit to you today, and I think you'll see as we unfold the message this morning, what this world needs and what God intended to impact this world for Jesus Christ is not believers in Jesus, but followers of Jesus Christ. Believers in Jesus won't get the job done. You believe, but the Lord is never content to allow you to stay just being a believer. He intends for you to grow. He intends for you to mature. He intends for you to go from just being a believer to being a follower of Jesus Christ. Now what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus Christ? I believe he tells us in this passage what that means and what, it inv what is involved in being a follower of Christ. And let me submit first of all to this morning if you're Jot down three words for me. It'll help you know what, what is involved. And number one, what's involved is crucifixion. Crucifixion. Notice what Jesus said in verse number 24. Then said Jesus unto His disciples, If any man will come after Me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow Me. Deny himself. Take up your cross to follow Jesus Christ. I think the cross would represent the will of God for a believer's life. I believe the cross represented the will of God for Jesus' life. I think it means are you willing to take up what God wants you to do with your life? Are you willing to merge your will to His will? Are you willing to submit your will to His will? and let Him do what He wants you to do with your life. The crucifixion of Jesus Christ led to the salvation of the world, at least making salvation possible to the world. But the crucified life of the Christian will, will result in sinners coming to know Christ as their Savior. If you don't die to self, if you're not willing to deny self, if you're not willing to live a crucified life, you'll never be used of God to point others to the crucified one. The cross of the Christian represents the sacrifices that are necessary to follow Jesus Christ. Now can I help you with something? As a new Christian maybe in the audience this morning, listen, I'll submit to you something that might help you. That following God's will and being a follower of Jesus Christ is never comfortable to your flesh. It won't like it. Okay? The flesh will want to stay in control. I'll preach the sermon. You listen to the sermon. All right? To be a follower of Christ, you have to bear the cross we're given. And that cross is there for us to crucify the flesh. The flesh represents the old nature. 
The flesh represents what I want, what I think, and what I feel. You know how you know how somebody lives who does not have Christ in their life? They live doing what I want, what I think, and what I feel. That's how they live. Now, as a believer, you have the choice to make. Do I still live doing what I want, what I think, and what I feel? Or do I live by the Spirit of God who dwells in me, by my faith in Jesus Christ, and He tells me what God wants, what God thinks, and what God feels? Now, which one do I follow? Now, here's the thing. If you want to be... That's why James tells us the the, the double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. What's double-minded mean? The flesh tells me, I want to do this, I want to feel this, I want to think this, and God says, no, you should do this, and I think this, and you should do... No, I think I should... No, God says do this. No, I think I should do this. No, God says do this. What are you doing? You're all... You're double-minded. And you know what happens? You never get anywhere. You're unstable in all your ways. Up and down and up and down... Everybody always has to check out to see whether you're up today or down today. How you, how, what, what kind of mood are you in now? You're unstable because you're double-minded. You've never learned to die to yourself. you never learned to deny yourself. The word deny means to deny utterly. It means to disown. It means to totally abstain. It means to forget oneself. It means to lose sight of oneself and one's own interests. Say, so, well, I got my rights. No. No, you don't. We are servants of Jesus Christ. You give up, you, you die to yourself. Paul wrote it this way I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. Hey, the middle letter of pride is I. I'm crucified with Christ. The middle letter of sin is I. I am crucified with Christ. Our issue is we're not willing to be crucified. We're not willing to deny ourselves. Now there's some other things the Bible says and Jesus said that we need to be able to deny. Look in Mark chapter 10. Would you hold your finger there and, or put a piece of paper in Matthew 16. We'll come back there. But look over to Mark chapter 10. The very book right after Matthew is Mark, Mark 10. And notice with me, if you will, verse 21. Well, let's back up. I'm going to get to verse 21. Let's back up and get the story starting in verse 17. And when he was gone forth in the way, there came one running and kneeled unto him and said unto him, Good Master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There's none good but one, that's God. Thou knowest the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, defraud not, honor thy father and mother. And he answered and said unto him, Master, all these have I observed from my youth. Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him. And said unto him, One thing thou lackest, go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. And come, take up the cross, and what? Follow me. Oh, but he was sad at that saying, and went away grieved. Why? For he had great possessions. What was his his issue? He isn't willing to, to deny his possessions. He isn't willing to crucify his possessions. It's really a lesson in priorities. There's nothing wrong, listen, with having possessions, but there is something absolutely wrong when possessions have a hold of you. Where so many Americans live. See, his stuff became his God. His things became his God. And listen, it may not just be that things you have, but listen, you you, you got so many things and so many payments that you are strapped financially. And so you have to get overtime, you have to get Sundays, you have to get every time they can give you some money because you are controlled by your possessions. And so when a special need arises and we say, hey, we need a special offering, 
in your heart you say, man, I'd like to give to that, but I can't. I got too many payments. We're strapped to our possessions. Easy to happen. Easy to happen in America. And there are folks in this room who, who are not in that way today, but at one time in their life they were that way. And they had to free themselves and deny themselves those possessions. Jesus said, no man can serve two masters. You cannot do it. You cannot serve God and mammon or money. Possessions can keep you from bearing the cross. You have to deny possessions. You have to learn sometimes you just have to say, no, I don't need that. Look, let me take a, a, a real quick quiz. How many of you have something at your house right now that you bought and you look at it now thinking, why in the world did I buy that? Hmm? Yeah. We all do. You've got stuff you're looking at thinking, man, that's been in here for how many years and we never use it? What are we doing with that? People park, people park thirty and $40,000 automobiles outside in the elements while they keep $1,000 worth of junk in their garage. <laughs> Figure that out. You know why? Possessions. Possessions. We're caught up in possessions. The second thing you have to deny yourself to is people. Let's go to Luke chapter 14. Would you go there please? Luke chapter 14. Keep going to your right. Right after Mark is Luke. Luke 14. <coughs> Jesus says in verse 26, Luke 14, If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, Yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. The word hate here is, is in, in fact, in another gospel. Jesus said, He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He's not saying you have to have a hatred, but he's saying it ought to in comparative terms, be that way. In other words, you can't put a father or mother ahead of the Lord. You can't put a wife or a, or a husband ahead of the Lord. We were talking the other day, the, every wife ought to be more than happy to be the second love of her husband's life as long as God is his first love. And by the way, every husband would want to be the second love of his wife's life as long as God is the first love of her life. That's the way God intended for it to be. But we're to love Christ supremely. We're to love Christ like Jesus told Peter on the shore of Galilee that day when he was frying the fish. Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He didn't say you couldn't love fish. Aren't you glad, Pete? He didn't say you couldn't love fishing. He said, but you can't love that more than you love me. You have to love me supremely. Again, in the text we read today, we talked about how Peter begins to rebuke Jesus for telling them about the suffering the Lord's going to have him go through. It doesn't, and when, listen, when Jesus told Peter, flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you, my Father which is in heaven, uh, Peter loved that. And Jesus loved Peter there. But let me ask you a question. When he said, get thee behind me, Satan, thou savorest not the things that be of God, but the things that be of men, did Jesus not love Peter anymore? No, he still loved him. He still loved him. But he's letting Peter know, you, you have to love me supremely. And, and, and Peter loved Jesus, but he didn't love him supremely. Did you know people can keep you from bearing your cross? Some people never want to do, never will do what God wants them to do because they're fearful of people. Family. Let me illustrate it for you. Go back to Genesis chapter 11, will you please? Genesis chapter 11, first book of the Bible. A familiar fellow where most of us are very familiar with named Abraham. <clears throat> Abraham's hometown was called Ur of the Chaldees.
Abraham's father was a fellow named Terah. Look in uh, chapter 11 and verse 29. It says, Haran died before his father Terah. So that would be uh, uh, in the land of his nativity in Ur of the Chaldees. Abram and Nahor took them wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai. The name of Nahor's wife, Milcah. The daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah, and the father of Iska. But Sarai was barren, she had no child. And Terah took Abram his son, and Lot the son of Haran his son's son, and Sarai his daughter-in-law. <coughs> now listen carefully, all right? And they went forth with them from Ur of the Chaldees to go to the land of Canaan. And they came unto Haran and dwelt there. And the days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. Now, verse 12, chapter 12, verse 1. Now the Lord had said. So he's not saying it now. He's telling us what he told Abraham to do. Past tense. Okay? What had God told Abraham to do? Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. But Abraham got up to leave and did he, did he leave his father and his kindred? No, he took them with him. And they went to sojourn, the Bible says there in verse 31, that, that they went to go into the land of Canaan. But when they got to Haran, they, they did what? They dwelt there. They stopped there. Why? His dad was sick and he ended up dying there. Well, he wasn't supposed to have dad with him. He's supposed to leave him behind. See? He was allowing people to keep him from doing what God wanted him to do. And God was gracious and He, he, he came, came to him again and, and He allowed him to continue. But you understand, uh, the, he, he was sitting down on the journey God had for him. Not that he didn't want to do what God wanted him to do. He left. But he didn't love God supremely. He didn't put God first. God isn't one that is just content to be on the list. He has to be number one on the list. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. The old song we sing sometimes on old-fashioned day, Brethren, we have met to worship. The last verse says, Let us love our God supremely. Let us love each other too. You have to be careful of who that you don't. Listen, you have to deny some people. Brother Danny prayed today, you know, we want the right people in our life and we need the wrong people out of our life. Because those who do not love the Lord will not help you serve the Lord. People can keep you from being a follower of Jesus Christ. Because people may keep you from living a crucified life and following the Lord and loving the Lord supremely. So we have to deny possessions, we have to deny people, but we also have to deny our own pride. Pride. You know, the cross is not a popular thing. Can I, can I help you know, if you're going to be a follower of Jesus Christ, it won't be a popular decision. You will be in the minority. We've been through this several times in the last few weeks. You know, broad is the way, wide is the gate that leads to destruction. And how many are on there? Many there be that go in there at. How many are on the broad way, the wide way? Many. How many are on the narrow way and straight is the gate that, that, that leads to life and few there be that find it? And so you're going to be in the minority. So you have to be willing to accept criticism. You have to be willing to accept people looking down on you and keep your humility. Paul said this way in 1 Corinthians 1 verse 18, The preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it's the power of God. To the average person who you say, I'm going to church Sunday morning, they'll think, well, what band is playing? What kind of music you got there? I mean, is it, is it cool to go? 
No, we just go and we sing songs and we listen to a guy preach to us. Huh? Man, that's kind of dull, isn't it? No, to those who are lost, it's foolishness. Ah, oh, but that's what you're saved. It's the power of God unto salvation. Totally different. The word foolishness is equated with silliness or absurdity. In other words, hey, the world has always considered Christians, I mean followers of Jesus Christ, to be a little weird. True followers of Christ are often viewed with disgust and contempt. Don't be surprised. Remember the old rugged cross? It's the emblem of suffering and shame. We live in a day and age when many Christians don't want to have any shame for Jesus Christ. But I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. It's never been popular with the world to be a Christian. The kind of Christianity that wants to be accepted by the world and fit in with the world and welcomed by the world, that's not the Christianity of the Bible. It's just not there. The one who is full of grace and truth that we talked about in Sunday school this morning. The one who is the epitome of, of graciousness and truthfulness, who had the proper balance that you could ever have as a Christian, walked this earth, they took him and they crucified him. Jesus looked at his followers and he said, If they hated me, they're going to hate you. And I could put a little parenthesis in there saying, Unless, you're, unless we are not like Him at all. If the world is embracing me as a believer, I ought to step back and think, what kind of believer am I? Am I truly a follower of Jesus Christ? So we have to have crucifixion. The second word I want you to jot down today is the word consecration. Consecration. We don't hear that word much in these days. But not only do we have to deny ourselves and take up our cross and live the crucified life, we have to live a consecrated life. Notice what Jesus said again in Matthew 16. He's saying, you are going to take up, um, uh, take up His cross and follow Me. It's an individual cross that we bear. And we bear it alone. The cross is always, as we mentioned earlier, a place of sacrifice for the believer. That's, that's a place of uh, presenting our bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable service. It's, it's offering ourselves to God. That's, consecration is to be set apart to God. Giving ourselves completely to Him. A lot of times we take far too lightly our consecration to Christ and our witness for Christ. And usually we take that lightly because if we took it seriously, we'd realize the price that could be paid for that. I'm always amazed that occasionally we'll, we'll get stories of, of Christian people, and I'm not just talking about non-Muslim. I told our Sunday school class, you have to be cautious sometimes when word comes back from other countries that uh, Muslims killed this many Christians. What they really mean is, they, they, sometimes, sometimes they're truly born-again Christians. But sometimes they're just people who aren't Muslim. The media will portray anybody who's not Muslim to be a Christian. But we know that's not the case. Okay, Someone can be not a Muslim, but not truly be born again. And so you have to be born again. But there's occasionally, we have, we have people who are being murdered, people who are being martyred for Jesus Christ that we never hear about. Our media will not report it to us. We don't know the sacrifice that, that, is, that is being paid for the cause of Jesus Christ. But if you want to be, listen, if I want God to use me in a powerful way, then I need to be powerfully consecrated to Him. God is a responder to what we do. He said, Draw nigh to me, and I will draw nigh to you. God says, oh, I just feel so far away from God. 
then God says, draw nigh to me. And I'll draw nigh to you. I want God to use me in a powerful way. God says, then powerfully present yourself to me. Let me see you come to me with all your heart. You'll seek me and you'll find me when you seek for me with all your heart. Not half-hearted, not, not, not going through the motions, but truly committed to seeking Jesus Christ. That consecration means sacrifice. The consecration means substitution. Because the cross is a place where Jesus died for us. He died in our place. And so I understand that, listen, if, if the cross for Jesus was where He died for others and He took my place and He took your place, then my cross must be a place where I die for the sake of others. It's... It's always easy to help somebody when it's convenient for me. You know what I found out? It's rarely convenient. The time to help somebody, the time to reach out to someone, the time to, to, to stop and invest some time is always when you can't afford it. The Christian's cross is where death takes hold so that the life of Christ can be manifested to the world. People will never see Jesus in us if we don't get out of the way first. And we have to die. Then there's no self-glory. You see, the Christian doesn't live for self-recognition. The Christian doesn't live for immediate gratification. The, 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 the follower of Jesus Christ is more interested in what's coming hereafter instead of what's coming right now. You're living with the long look, not the short look. That's a follower of Jesus Christ. The cross, place of sacrifice and substitution, but it's also a place of shame. The Bible says in Hebrews 12, look at Hebrews 12 with me, will you? Are you okay this morning? We're almost through. Hebrews 12. Well, I'm glad I have a Bible this morning. Hebrews 12. Familiar verses to us in verses 1 and 2. <coughs> I want you to look at them though. Where the Bible says, Wherefore seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which thus so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before Him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Several things to notice here. Obviously, if Christ endured the cross, we're going to have to endure some things. We were talking to somebody, I can't remember who I was talking to the other day, and they said, you know, one of the things we hear way too much of in these days is, I'm offended. That offended me. Well, why don't you just endure some things? Hmm? And, and get, get some toughness. Uh, Paul wrote Timothy, who is preachable. You know what he told him? Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Sometimes you just got to endure it. Jesus endured the cross. There's going to be some difficulties, but keep going. There's going to be some tough times, but keep going. It's going to be some, some hardships, but keep going. Jesus kept going <laughs> through all He went through. I'm glad He did. He despised the shame. Jesus didn't enjoy the disgrace of Calvary any more than you or I would have. And that pain and suffering and the absolute scorn and torture that the Lord Jesus went through is something you and I could never imagine. And by the way, it is, it is not even something that Hollywood is able to portray. We will never fully understand what Jesus went through to pay for our sin. But He remained faithful.
The last word I want you to write down this morning is the word confirmation. Conformation, not confirmation. Conform, C-O-N-F-O-R-M. Take up, deny yourselves, take up the cross and follow me. That means we follow the example of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> That's what it means to follow. It means to observe, it means to, to uh, I was looking at just a minute ago, to obey, to observe, to practice, to act in conformity to. It's our duty to follow the commands of Christ. That's what a, that's what a follower does. Jesus prayed in the garden. He asked the disciples to pray. And when He went on a little further, Jesus prayed and He sweat as it were great drops of blood and He was in great agony that night. And when He came back to those disciples who were with Him and who He spent three years of His life investing in, boy, they were on their face crying and praying and just right with Him, weren't they? No, they're sleeping. I don't know about you, but that would have been awful discouraging to me. <laughs> the cross is a... The example of Jesus is an example of humility and obedience. When you... Listen, the very term follow means it comes to a point in my life where I don't lead anymore, I follow. Are you still leading your life or are you following Jesus Christ? And the way you can tell that is when you come to different things in your life, you know what you find yourself saying? Well, I think this is okay. Well, I think it's okay to do this. Well, I don't see anything wrong with this. Well, I don't see what's so bad. Well, you're leading with you. What does God say? Are you, are you leading still or are you following? I want to be a follower of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Conforming to His example. Focusing on his endurance as he went to the cross. Man, I don't want to... Go back to Hebrews 12. Are you there still? Hebrews 12. I, I'm the only one who turned away. huh? Hebrews 12. <clears throat> we talked about how uh, he endured the cross, despising shame, and sat down right hand of God. Now look at verse 3. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. You better consider Christ and what He went through, and He endured, and He stayed strong, and He didn't faint, and He didn't go back. And you better understand, if I'm going to follow His example, I've got to endure some things. I can't let it faint. I can't let it get to me. I can't say I'm tired of fighting. I can't say I'm tired of battling. I can't say I'm tired of doing this and just quit. I said to our men yesterday morning at breakfast, I think it's, it's some incredible total uh, weekly how many churches close uh, in the United States. It's, 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 not, it's, it's over a thousand. That's not churches. Listen, churches don't close. Christians quit. If Christians wouldn't quit, churches wouldn't close. Why do churches quit? People quit going. And they don't endure like they need to and, and follow the example of Jesus Christ. And how do you do it? By considering Him. He's our example. Man, if He went through that and He endured it, man, I can endure this. I can get through this and so can you. Our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. 2 Corinthians 4.17 so the question is, do you want to be a follower of Christ? Are you willing to use those three words, crucifixion? Are you willing to be consecrated to Him? Are you willing to be conformed to Jesus Christ? And to follow His steps? To, to, to be led by His example? And to follow Him? Deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow Jesus. The songwriter said, Must Jesus bear the cross alone and all the world go free? No, there's a cross for everyone. 
and there's a cross for me. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Father, I pray you'll take the truth this morning and allow us to be followers of Jesus Christ. I believe this world is in desperate need of followers of Jesus. Willing to observe, willing to conform, willing to deny, willing to take up our cross and follow Jesus. I pray, God, that you would put it in the heart of those in this room that know you as their Savior, that they would be followers of Jesus Christ. And they understand what that means. It means denying some things, dying to some things, consecrating themselves to you, conforming themselves to the image of your Son, Jesus Christ, allowing the Spirit of God to conform us to Jesus. Enduring some difficulties. Staying on track, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. I pray you've used the message to speak to hearts this morning. Any in this room, they've never believed in Jesus. They've never come to Christ for salvation. And trusted Him to give them the gift of eternal life. I pray they'd trust Him today. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. I'll finish the prayer in just a moment. I wonder how many folks here this morning could say, Pastor, there's a time in my life when I knew I was a sinner and I needed a Savior. And Jesus Christ was a Savior I needed. And there's a time when I called on Jesus and I believed in Him from my heart. And I know Jesus forgave my sin. I know He saved my soul. I know that I'd go to heaven because I know Jesus is my Savior. Would you slip your hand up for a moment that I may see it? Say, Pastor, that's my testimony this morning. I know that I'm saved. All right, you may put it down. You're here today and would say, Pastor, I don't know for sure. I don't know for sure that if I died, I'd go to heaven. I don't have any assurance that that would happen. In fact, I might, I, I'm pretty sure I'd go to the other place. Would you let me pray for you? I'll not embarrass you. I'll not call you out, but I'll pray for you. Would you slip your hand up right now and put it back down and say, Pastor, pray for me this morning. I don't know for sure if I died, I'd go to heaven. I don't have that assurance. I couldn't raise my hand the first time, but I'll just raise it now and say, pray for me, Pastor. Would you do that? Just slip it up and put it back down. I'll see it. The message was to believers this morning. And you have to look at your heart this morning and say, am I a follower of Jesus? Oh, I didn't ask if you loved him. But I am asking if you love Him supremely. You're willing to die to self, die to some possessions, die to some people, die to some pride. Willing to completely consecrate yourself, powerfully consecrate yourself to God. So He can powerfully use you. You're willing to conform. To, say, to, to come to God and say, conform me to the image of your Son. Understanding what that means. You're going to have to endure some hardness. But you'll do it keeping your eyes on Jesus. How many believers here this morning that say, Preacher, the Spirit of God is speaking to my heart. I desire to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Pray for me this morning, Pastor. Will you put your hand up, Christian? Amen. Amen. Wonderful. You may put them down. In a moment I'll pray and we'll have our invitation. It, if God has spoken to your heart and you want to be a follower, now's the time to consecrate yourself. Now's the time to give yourself to God. Bow the knee to Him. Write it in the front of your Bible. March the 6th, 2016, I give myself to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Drive the stake down. And then by God's grace, ask Him to help you do it. 
Heavenly Father, have your way now in this invitation. I thank you, Lord, for speaking to people's hearts. And I pray that each one will do what you're telling them to do in their heart now this morning. Lord, I pray if any are here today and they've never received Christ as their Savior, when others are coming to pray, they would slip out and come and say, I'd like someone to take a Bible and show me how I can know I'm on my way to heaven. If you're here today and they've been saved, they trust you as their Savior, but Lord, they've never been baptized, I pray they'd come and say, I want to obey the Lord in baptism. Or whatever it is that you're dealing with their heart about, I just pray that they would obey you this morning, that no one would resist. But Lord, more importantly, we could leave this place today saying we are going to be followers of Jesus Christ. Have your way in every heart, please, and I'll thank you for it. With your heads bowed, you stand to your feet. As you stand to your feet, our pianist will play. As she plays her invitation hymn this morning, God has spoken to your heart. Respond to him today. The altar is open for you. That's right. That's right. Amen. Consecrate yourself to the Lord. upon Jesus look full in his wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace Father we thank you morning. Thank you, Lord, for speaking to our hearts today. Thank you for Jesus Christ. And Lord, if it weren't for Him, we, we would be nowhere today. How lost we would be. Lord, thank you for each one who's made their way to the service this morning. I pray that you have ministered to their heart. And Father, I pray you'll give us a good afternoon and that you'll bring us back this evening for the evening services. And Lord, that we will leave this place followers of Jesus Christ, loving you supremely with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind, and all our strength. It's in Jesus' name we ask these things. Amen. 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 I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by His blood. Join tears with Jesus as we travel this side. For I'm a part of the family, the family of God. Give me just a minute. All right. <laughs> 